Good morning and welcome. Thank you for coming out for the second day of our conference, Merchants of the Printed Word. Uh, we are on our third session, and I'm going to introduce all of our speakers at once, and then we will continue. Uh, again, I'm going to just keep time and uh, have some comments at the end. Our first speaker is Alpin Razzi from the University of Toronto, and the title of his talk is The Creolization of Samuel Keimer, Global Contexts of the Barbados Gazette. Our second speaker is Patrick Tardou of the Bibliothèque Atien de Pérez de Saint Esprit. Uh, forgive me, I don't have any French whatsoever, so I'm sure I just butchered that. Uh, and his title is The Book Trade from Saint Domingue to Haiti. And our third speaker is Christina Soriano from Villanova University with the title Reading in a Province with No Printing Press, Literacy and Circulation of Books in Late 18th Century Colonial Caracas. So let's begin with Alpen Razi. Good morning. Um, I'm going to be experimenting for the first time with the paperless notes, so we'll see how this goes. Hopefully I don't um, screw it up too much. Um, having set up shop as a printer shortly, before, uh, shortly after his arrival in Barbados in 1730, Samuel Keimer has fairly been credited with establishing the first truly Creole print culture in the Anglo-Caribbean world. Uh, this despite the fact that neither his Barbadian press uh, nor the newspaper uh, which quickly issued from it uh, were the first of their respective kinds in the British West Indies. Indeed, um, both first appeared in Jamaica where a printing press was established in 1718 and an English language newspaper, uh, the Jamaica Current, began publication the same year. In fact, Keimer cannot even lay claim to bringing the press to Barbados itself. That achievement goes to David Harry, who had been apprenticed as a printer uh, for, to Keimer in Philadelphia, uh, where he was able to eventually purchase Keimer's press and later reestablish it in uh, Bridgetown, Barbados in 1730. Completing their reversal of roles, Harry eventually hired his former master as his own journeyman, uh, following Keimer's emigration to the island in that same year. But rapidly falling into debt, Harry was forced to sell Keimer's old press back to Keimer, uh, who took over operations in Barbados until uh, at least the end of uh, 1738. So a little over 100 years after the English had established their hold over the small island colony of Barbados, Keimer's newspaper, the Barbados Gazette, began its run as a weekly broadsheet on October 9th, 1731. It was likely the first English language newspaper in the Eastern Caribbean, uh, the second in the West Indies, and perhaps only the seventh in all of the Americas. Yet the significance of the Gazette results uh, more from its unique situation, both in time and place, uh, for the ways in which it registers, reinforces, and challenges uh, the shifting ideological worldview of British imperialism at the turn of century. Indeed, as numerous cultural and intellectual studies of early Hanoverian uh, Britain have illustrated, the early decades of the 18th century saw the emergence of a powerful new strain of imperial nationalism. At the same time, this reconfiguration in the sense of imperial space combined with a rapidly crystallizing uh, global network of trade and communication, uh, allowing colonial subjects to assert a place for themselves and their localities within a unified conception of empire, uh, what the historian David Armitage calls the uh, newly pan-Atlantic consciousness of the 1730s and 40s. And though, print, uh, and though polemical print publications by Barbadian writers have frequently been noticed as um, an important evidentiary source for the sea change, um, this paper suggests that the Barbados Gazette itself offers one of the richest case studies in the development of a wide-ranging English Atlantic worldview. Indeed, uh, the Gazette was the earliest to have its articles reprinted in London periodicals such as the Gentleman's Magazine, um, giving metropolitan readers an inside look into the literary, social, and political world of the Creoles. 
Many of these articles were, in turn, collected and republished in London as this massive two-volume anthology called Caribbeana in 1741. Um, and that's fortunate because uh, there's not a single extant issue of the Barbados, because there, there's only one, excuse me, and I think it's at the Bernie collection. Um, there's a handful of others, too, but they're from later in the period um, after Keimer's death. Um, and after which, obviously, he, after his tenure as an editor, in which the newspaper um, significantly uh, was far less interesting, in my opinion. Um, so for this project, I've been working with the Caribbean Anthology to try to reconstruct the social, literary, and material world of the Barbados Gazette and its editor, Samuel Keimer. In this brief talk, I'll explore just a few of the ways in which Keimer, as a cultural worker on an island which relied so heavily on the use of slave labor, encapsulated the many paradoxes of the early 18th century empire, a period in which Britons proclaimed they never will be slaves, even as their sense of national identity was extending to include the slaveholding plantocracies of the New World. Yet, Keimer's own relationship to such imperial triumphalism was deeply complicated by his experiences as a printer and editor in London and Philadelphia. Experiences that encouraged him to self-identify as a quote-unquote white Negro and to establish one of the first schools for free and enslaved people of African descent in colonial America. And this, he absolutely did establish the first school in colonial um, Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. Um, and this is often credited to Anthony Benezet. Um, uh, people do note that Keimer wanted to start one, but I've actually found numerous um, sources confirming that he did, that he was quite successful for a period of time. There's all these sort of snide references to Keimer uh, by his rivals among his you know, coterie of, of sable African minds studying under him as if to say, you know, this was what all, all he was good for in, the, in you know, these very negrophobic terms. Um, so this talk draws on the biographical and historical context surrounding Keimer and his Gazette uh, to trace the complex uh, material, ideological, and cultural entanglements between the colonial newspaper and the newly uh, emergent pan-Atlantic consciousness. As the title of my talk suggests, the biographical context surrounding Keimer powerfully animate the many paradoxes of the Caribbean print culture, which he was so instrumental in forging. Today, I'll be focusing primarily on Keimer's earlier work in England and America before examining some of the ways in which these earlier contexts shed light on his activities in the Caribbean. In particular, uh, I'm going to be sharing my attempts to make sense of the idiosyncratic and ad, ad hoc Protestant identity which Keimer cultivated throughout his life and career. In his vast array of personal writings while in England, North America, and the West Indies, Keimer continually invoked themes of literal and figurative enslavement to frame his activities as a printer, placing himself within a familiar reformation narrative of social progress and personal emancipation through education and access to print. Um, and of course, I don't mean to reinforce that widespread cliche that uh, Professor uh, Mayard was discussing last night of the sort of Protestant monopoly of, of print culture, um, which she so rigorously refuted. But, you know, uh, certainly in the 18th century English mind, print, uh, human emancipation, social progress, and reformation were all intimately bound up in, in, this, in this age of reform, right? Um, and uh, uh, Keimer was certainly um, preoccupied with these themes. So a little bit about the genesis of this project. My interest in Keimer grew out of not one, not two, but three seemingly unrelated ventures, uh, which I ultimately realized uh, were, in fact, or did, excuse me, in fact, share a common thread by way of uh, Samuel Keimer. I first encountered him several years ago as a master's student conducting some research into the early print culture of the uh, colonial West Indies, uh, which, of course, one can trace back to the endeavors of Keimer. Um, so after this initial encounter, I came upon Keimer's name again last year when I was uh, assisting, or excuse me, two years ago when I was assisting in an American literature survey. Um, those of you uh, familiar with the work of Benjamin Franklin and his autobiography will note that Keimer is uh, quite a, a prominent player uh, therein. In fact, prior to his relocation to Barbados, uh, Keimer had first emigrated to colonial Pennsylvania from England in 1722 and opened up a print shop in which the young Franklin was eventually employed. There, Keimer began publication of a newspaper with the rather imposing title of The Universal Instructor in All the Arts and Sciences and Pennsylvania Gazette. And, and he also established a school, which I've already mentioned, the first of its kind, dedicating, quote, to teaching his poor brethren, the male Negroes, to read scripture, end quote. 
But it was while doing early research for um, a dissertation chapter on Daniel Defoe that I first, uh, that, that I re-encountered Keimer's name um, again, and things started to just click into place and that I started to realize that this wasn't, the, there wasn't just an abundance of interesting fellows named Keimer spread all over the world, that this was in fact the same figure and he um, was circulating around as a merchant of the printed world. Um, and then from there, this kind of preoccupation has been with him has been um, kind of uh, gaining momentum. Um, so to summarize very quickly, uh, the, the dissertation research I've been doing on Defoe um, focuses on his representations of slavery and the ways in which slave societies appear as a highly allegorical, uh, as uh, excuse me, highly highly allegorical social landscapes um, across his fictional, didactic, and colonial writings. Um, while the dominant approach to reading slavery and Defoe's writing on slavery is to evaluate how they reflected or engaged the contemporary historical context of uh, imperialism and um, uh, colonialism. Um, uh, but I've increasingly come to think of Defoe as himself a kind of theorist of what the slavery historian Orlando Patterson famously described as the social death associated with the social relations, or rather anti-social relations, of uh, tyrannical mastery and enslavement. Um, within this framework, the figure of the slave, um, and especially of uh, the African chattel slave, appears less as the subject of colonial discourse um, uh, that reinforces a set of imperial relations or racial differences. Instead, Defoe frequently employs the slave figure to illustrate a broader, more universal social and moral theory um, about reform and social regeneration. Um, in exploring these facets of Defoe's writing, um, I became fascinated by his relationship to Keimer, um, who I think offers quite a striking case study in the negotiation and appropriation of the figure of the slave um, to frame uh, one's experiences as a printer. Here, I'd like to briefly explore um, the collaborations between Keimer and Defoe and the, varied, uh, the various fruits which emerged from their association, um, and also with uh, something of an eye towards maybe establishing something of a prehistory to the print identity complex that uh, Professor Rezek was talking about yesterday. As a printer whose services uh, Defoe engaged frequently and who in equal measures employed the authorial skills of Defoe, uh, Keimer would have undoubtedly held an interest for Defoe that extended beyond that of a mere professional collaborator. To understand why, one first needs to reckon the central status of print as both an agent of uplift and corruption in Defoe's broader social theories. Uh, for Defoe, uh, the printer medium offered um, more than a neutral technology of communication to be used or abused by uh, persons engaging in its transmission. Indeed, it was frequently depicted in his writings as a central player in a drama of good and evil, of the promise of social progress and the threat of imminent social disintegration. Um, in his essay on the regulation of uh, the press, a progressive vision of social improvement associated with the printer, uh, printed world is countered by a vision of the impending social annihilation resulting from the licentiousness of the press. And as Defoe declared in the preface to his early journalistic narrative, The Storm, quote, the preaching of sermons is speaking to a few of mankind. Printing of books is talking to the whole world. Thus, if a sermon be ill-grounded, the preacher imposes upon us uh, he trespasses on a few, but if the printed book obtrudes a falsehood, if a man tells a lie in print, he abuses and degrades all of mankind and imposes upon the whole world. He causes our children to tell lies after, this, uh, after us and their children after them cause the end of the world. So yeah, it's, uh, it's high stakes, you know. <laughs> of course, as anyone who's familiar with Defoe, even just you know the, the most cursory uh, kind of relationship to his novels, knows there is a great deal of irony surrounding the problem of telling lies in print um, when considering Defoe as a master of early fiction. Um, and this re ambivalence really comes to the fore during his period of association with Keimer. Um, for instance, one of Defoe's central outputs for Keimer's press was a series of so-called Quaker tracks, um, which witness. Uh, which witnesses, rather, a key development in Defoe's experiment with the uh, impersonation of voices, uh, offering a fictionalized first-person narrative, uh, or narrator, excuse me, in the manner uh, that very much prefigures his later novels. Moreover, uh, it was in the same period that Defoe published uh, the first of his, it was in the same period, rather, that he published the first of his dialogue and narrative-based family instructor writings that are usually regarded um, as a traditional precursor to his fictional phase. 
But for Defoe, these acts of um, imposing, these acts of fiction, would have undoubtedly been bound up within the legitimacy of allegorical and spiritual truth in religious and didactic expression, and stood starkly in contrast uh, with the corrupt practices of the press uh, that he so frequently dec uh, decried. Yet ironically, for Defoe and the early 18th century British uh, public, no one better exemplified the latter form of uh, imposing, of, of manipulating and corrupting than Keimer and the fringe cult of religious enthusiasts known as the French prophets, whom he joined in 1707. In 1718, Keimer would publish an autobiographical narrative entitled A Brand Pucked from the Burning, um, in which he would relate the history of how he fell in with this charismatic millennialist cult, um, describing the powerful mental thrall in which he was held captive to the group. And before I forget, it occurs to me, um, when I was here to, uh, last spring um, on a short-term visiting fellowship, I discovered an original copy of Keimer's autobiography in the collection of the John Carter Brown Library. And Matthew Rustle can actually attest to the shriek that emanated from my voice because it wasn't in the online catalog and I was just kind of going through the cards and there it was and I almost like welled up with tears. It was so amazing. Um, okay, sorry. Yes. So back to the autobiography. Uh, the so-called French prophets had arrived from London, from France in the early years of the 18th century and consisted of a group of exiled camisards, um, radical French Huguenot Protestants um, who had waged insurrectionary warfare against the French state from the mountains of Savannah. Um, almost immediately after their arrival, the group made an extraordinary impact upon the London public. Um, the very spectacular nature of their public rituals, uh, the vigor with which their religious enthusiasm seemed to be transmitted to onlookers at their meeting, and the spread of their apocalyptic prophecies through the mass distribution of printed transcripts greatly alarmed many of London's intellectual and political elites. The impressive list of commentators and critiques, or critics, excuse me, of the French prophets include such 18th century luminaries as, as uh, Jonathan Swift, Alexander Pope, Addison and Steele, the Earl of Shaftesbury, Benjamin Hoadley, Isaac Newton, and even Queen Anne herself. Um, the cresting of critical attitudes against the prophets in England occurred when a certain prophet uh, predicted the, um, uh, the impending resurrection of uh, one of their fellow prophets who had uh, recently departed. Um, the date of this miraculous resurrection was fixed on January 1st, uh, 1708. And when he failed to reanimate, critics seized on this failure to ridicule and decry the pretending false prophets. In his autobiography, Keimer describes himself as a trusting and gullible young man taken advantage of by the charismatic group for whom he published uh, a, a number of incendiary pro-Jacobite pamphlets as well as, quote, sundry seditious libels directed against Queen Anne's ministry. By 1715, Keimer found himself imprisoned in Newgate. Um, uh, one of several prisons in which he languished for nearly six years as a result of both crimes committed and debts incurred during his association with the prophets. Towards the end of his narrative, Keimer describes languishing in what is essentially a prison house of horrors, his reputation in tatters, abandoned by all of his friends, and near total destitution. He relates how one solitary individual responded to his desperate pleas for relief. Quote, one who had known the different stations of life, from the closest conversation of a king and queen to the fatiguing difficulties of a dungeon, end quote. Keimer then reprints the kind letter from his associate, Daniel Defoe, that accompanied this much needed gift of money. In it, Defoe pointedly encourages in Keimer, quote, a sincere, a, a sincere sense of breaking in upon principle and consciousness, offering him up a, a prayer put to heaven, though in verse, written while under deep and a dreadful affliction. The eight lines of verse uh, exhort Keimer to transform his enslavement to sin into servitude to God and to learn from his sufferings and experience. Since, quote, if affliction sees and cause of afflictions remain, the joy of deliverance will be short, end quote. Keimer describes how Defoe's letter instigates a profoundly uh, personal conversion experience, allowing himself to finally shake off the thrall of the uh, false prophets after nearly 10 years. Moreover, he rises to Defoe's exhortation to serve God uh, by appending to his text a lengthy missive addressed to current members of the cult in which he attempts to disabuse them uh, of their irrational delusions much as Defoe had done him. In 1722, the year of Keimer's departure for North America and four years after his uh, publication of the brand, this same verse 
this verse that Defoe uh, sent Keimer, would reappear again in Daniel Defoe's uh, novel, The History and Remarkable Life of the Truly Honorable Colonel Jack, uh, with minor adjustments and the inclusion of a few more lines. Um, here, the parallels between Keimer, the historical figure, and the character of Colonial Jack are unmistakable. Um, <clears throat> for Keimer, uh, imprisonment in Gatehouse literalized his spiritual captivity uh, to the French prophets, and Defoe's deprogramming letter immediately precedes his own moment of uh, conversion, uh, convinced for the first time the error of the prophet's ways. Defoe's novel, on the other hand, sees Jack receiving the same verse from his, other, uh, from his otherwise, um, excuse me, from his own wise and benevolent teacher, who likewise contributes to Jack's conversion after a period of indentured slave labor on a Virginia plantation. Similarly, following his royal pardon for participating in the Jacobite uprising of 1715, Jack, Jack's eventual pains to the House of Hanover are mirrored by Keimer's equally over-the-top praises of the forgiving King George, whose merits are repeatedly extolled in his autobiography whenever Keimer confesses to his role in publishing pro-Jacobite accounts of the uh, 1715. And if the fictional Jack here seems to embody certain aspects of the historical Keimer, so too does Keimer himself seem to return the favor. Emigrating to the slave society of uh, early colonial Pennsylvania the year after the publication of Colonel Jack, Keimer began to publicly style himself as a white Negro, and one of his first initiatives, like Jack's, was to educate the black population. In fact, the lines of influence seem to come full circle with Keimer's serial publication of Defoe's didactic manual, The Religious Courtship, in 1729. In fact, the first American publication of Defoe's work. Um, much as Colonel Jack and Robinson Crusoe had imaginatively done before him, Keimer pointedly transformed his American adventures into the vehicle by which a Defovian pedagogy was transmitted to the farthest reaches of the empire. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in trying to make sense of this dynamic collaboration between uh, the two, I've been returning to Defoe, uh, uh, excuse me. I've been returning to Defoe's own account of the experiences with uh, persecute, the persecutorial environment surrounding the press in early Hanoverian, excuse me, in early Hanover, England. As Keimer hints in the description of his benefactor, Defoe would have understood uh, better than anyone uh, what could happen to writers, printers, and publishers uh, who had fallen out of favor with the public um, uh, and with the government or with their uh, contemporaries in the print trade. It's useful, therefore, to examine Defoe's original epistle to Keimer alongside his own letters to would-be benefactors, such as the influential dissenter William Penn and the ministers Robert Harley and Sidney Godolphin, whom Defoe reached out to while himself imprisoned um, for his um, uh, authorial activities in 1703 and then again in 1712 and 1713. For instance, Defoe's letters to Harley, whose direct intervention released him from prison on three separate occasions, are full of humble submission and profuse gratitude, avowing the loyalty which Defoe was able to demonstrate repeatedly throughout his career, and often to little further gain. Moreover, as Paula Backscheider has pointed out, these letters are full of biblical allusions and metaphors of slavery, um, which see Defoe identifying with a variety of social outcasts and downtrodden, um, lepers, blind men, slaves, paupers, etc. But it is the metaphors of mastery and servitude which most frequently occur here, and which Defoe sets against the rampant tyranny and persecution which continually beleaguered him. Ultimately, the self-representation that emerges from Defoe's letters um, certainly complicates the common framing of Defoe as the great ideologue for various forms of mastery. Uh, from the time of his first pardon, Defoe describes himself as Harley's servant in terms which remarkably prefigure the cross-cultural and transracial uh, relationships of masters and slaves in his various novels. For instance, uh, those between Friday and Crusoe, between Mouchat and Colonel Jack, between the Black Prince and Captain Singleton, and between the Black Toby and uh, young Jackie in The Family Instructor. In every case, um, the relationship is solidified because one has saved uh, the other, and the laws of God and nature agree upon an obligation, um, which transforms the abject slave into a grateful servant, who is bound to his master by the mutualistic terms of loyalty and friendship, rather than by threats or the use of physical or social violence. 
Returning to Keimer's own ultimate uh, identification as a white Negro in the slaveholding society of uh, colonial Pennsylvania, quote unquote white Negro, I remain fascinated by the ways in which his transracial identification and his appropriation of the figurative power of slavery remains embedded within this broader field of representation that emerged out of and in response to the social world of the press. While in England, uh, Keimer drew upon his literal captivity in prison to render the mental slavery of his French prophecy, um, through which he became enthralled to the group as a printer. And his release from prison coincided with his conversion out of uh, prophecy, and he rendered both struggles in the literal terms of chattel slavery and manumission. Similarly, during moments of acute crisis in America, Keimer would continue to return uh, to the rhetoric of slavery and servitude to narrate his sufferings and his experiences of persecution. Indeed, the loss of friends and fortune uh, would become as common an occurrence for Keimer in Philadelphia as they were in London. As a merchant of the printed word, it seems, Keimer remained hopelessly inept, at least as far as where maintaining an economically viable business was concerned. Um, as the historian Kevin Arthur has noted, quote, it would seem that he saw the Pennsylvania Gazette, his Philadelphia newspaper, essentially as a means of universally instructing others in his gnosis, um, and that commercial considerations were secondary, which is one of the reasons why Franklin, whose thrust was wholly commercial, was easily able to undermine uh, the financial success of, of uh, Keimer's Gazette. Um, the full realization of the extent to which um, Keimer had, uh, to which he had been betrayed by his former friend Franklin became apparent to Keimer one night in June 1729 when he was, quote, um, awakened when fast asleep in bed about 11 at night, overtired with the labor of the day and taken away from his dwelling by a writ and summons. It basely and confidently given out that he was that very night about to run away a fugitive, though there was not the least color or ground for such a vile report, end quote. While imprisoned, again, uh, Keimer would issue a verse poem, again, called Just Apology, in which he invoked the familiar language of his earlier autobiography and his letter from Defoe. In the poem, the sense of missionary self-importance is manifest um, in his attempts to frame himself as a would-be servant of God whose efforts are continually thwarted by the tyrannical depravity of those around him, especially Benjamin Franklin. Um, quote, I've often studied, and this is from the poem of uh, Just Apology, I've often studied others' good far more than did my own, yet those with might and main have stood striving to pull me down. But wheresoever I cry to thee, meaning Jesus, and fix on thee my mind, in prison was at liberty, in liberty confined. The poem is just one of many examples in which Keimer continually recasts himself in the densely Protestant terms of a suffering galley slave, uh, whose hardships offer redemptive models that can touch the hearts of his enemies, showing them the error of their ways and presumably inspiring them to leave him alone. Um, there are many other representations, uh, or excuse me, instances of these um, representational strategies of, of using the figurative language of, of slavery all throughout his writings. Um, um, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna cut it short and move along. Um, with these themes in mind, though, I wanna return finally to the context of the West Indies to explore how these considerations might shed light on the Creole print culture, uh, which Keimer helped forge through the Barbados Gazette. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, focus just on two sustained bodies of writing in the newspaper which seem particularly relevant uh, in terms of uh, Keimer's lifelong attempts to fashion himself as an agent of uh, emancipatory reformation. Um, and um, I'm almost done. Uh, the first is a lengthy analysis uh, of the 1735 trial of John Peter Zanger, um, whom I'm sure many of you are familiar with, a New York-based uh, publisher, editor, and printer who was accused of printing seditious libels um, in his editorials against the royal governor of New York. Um, Zanger was successfully defended by the prominent lawyer, Andrew Hamilton, and ultimately acquitted by a jury in direct defiance of the trial judge's instructions. Um, and uh, though the historical influence of this trial remains contested, it clearly aided in helping to win press freedoms in both Britain and the colonies. Undoubtedly, this was due to the Gazette's analysis, which first appeared as a series of let letters written by the uh, pseudonymous Anglo-Americanus and Indus Britannicanus um, in the summer of 1737, and then were published uh, separately in Philadelphia and London as a book for law students, and then continually republished throughout the century. Uh, the second body of writings concerns a series of around 40 poems composed of an anonymous lady, which have been attributed to Martha Folk Sampson by Phyllis Guskin. 
Of these, the critic Bill Overton has persuasively shown that about 26 were in actuality the work of the poet, noting, quote, not only are they the best love poems of their period, but some of them stand in comparison um, with English love poems of any period, not, ex not excluding Shakespeare. Um, alongside those of the anonymous lady, uh, the many other poems which appeared in the Gazette are clearly the product of uh, uh, Keimer's frequent calls uh, from his Barbadian readers to provide, quote, a supply of entertaining pieces uh, from some of the top geniuses in Barbados, um, as would make the, uh, this paper uh, in request in foreign parts, as well as with Barbadians. Uh, undoubtedly, the Zenger trial analysis and the elaborate poetry of the Gazette reflect uh, the critical attempts of the colony to transform itself from a roughly hewn frontier colony into a site of cultural progress, one with an active uh, political voice and a demonstrable uh, core of cultural and social civility. However, unlike Keimer's activities in Philadelphia, his Barbadian career leaves open the question of where and how actual literal slaves figure into his social vision of an island colony um, where political and cultural progress was contingent on the denial of even the most basic human rights um, to its enslaved workers. Um, and an estimate from, 18, seven, uh, excuse me, from 1730 puts a population of Barbados as, at about 18,000 whites and 65,000 blacks. So, I mean, that gives you an idea of the extent to which this was a genuinely mud sill society and in which um, slaves labored under what had already become uh, quite possibly the deadliest uh, slave system, uh, plantation slave system in the new world. Um, so uh, I'm going to try and wrap this up really quickly. Um, it's tempting to want to view Keimer's arrival in Barbados through the lens of his, you know, putting forward uh, uh, his didactic mission, this mission he has. And in fact, his arrival there coincides uh, with these attempts uh, to establish a new vestry school in Barbados, which uh, as a would-be, you know, pedagogue, Keimer would have undoubtedly been drawn towards. However, um, unlike in Philadelphia, the proscriptions against black education were so formal and so fierce um, that he would have uh, quickly uh, fallen afoul of the uh, slaveholding establishment of the plantocracy had he really had, um, had he really engaged in any attempts to um, engage in that kind of missionary work, engage in that kind of religious instruction or even basic literacy as he seemed to have in um, Philadelphia. On the other hand, given this affective engagement with slavery, uh, given this investment of himself as a quote unquote white Negro, um, it's entirely plausible that some of the anonymous voices uh, that appear in the, the massive um, anthology of Caribbeana uh, may have themselves been black. Um, and as I hope to do more archival research on this project, I hope to answer some of those questions. But principally, I hope to find um, some more evidence, some evidence of the sort that we have about his activities in Philadelphia in, in the shop he shared with Franklin, um, specifically about the day-to-day -day operations of the printery, um, the extent to which he used slave labor, um, which we can extrapolate based on other West Indian contexts that that, that was the case, much as Franklin had done um, in, in Philadelphia. Um, and so hope to, uh, you know, through this, any of these archival findings continue to develop this um, strange, cultivated, um, enslaved print culture that he um, uh, tried to develop throughout his career. Um, for the time being, what is clear is that the Gazette offered Barbados not only a viable tool for its ongoing effort to situate itself within a social and cultural matrix of progress and reformation, but more importantly, to publicize widely its successes in doing so. Indeed, the global scale of the newspaper with the global scale of the newspaper, Keimer finally succeeded in fulfilling his longed for vision of a universal instructor in the Barbados Gazette, producing an expansive and efficient didactic tool that could function as an agent of ref reformation, whose sphere of influence extended globally throughout the British Empire. Apropos of transatlantic circulation of books, I'd like to conclude with one final image of books crossing borders. Having arrived in Bridgetown, Barbados in 1730, Keimer spent the next 10 years producing a popular, high-quality colonial periodical, the many issues of which were sent to London and abroad, where they were compiled together in the Caribbean anthology. Um, and uh, the anthology itself also traveled uh, widely um, to a number of interesting locations, including Philadelphia, where at least one copy was found cataloged in 1790 in the personal library of Benjamin Franklin. A laggard testament, however reluctant, uh, to the merits of his erstwhile employer. So thank you very much. And now we will continue with Patrick Tardieu, 
with the uh, paper Book Trade from Sundaman to Haiti. Good morning. Thank you, Ken, for, for inviting me, for the GECB to invite me to participate in, the, in this uh, symposium. Uh, I will try to explain how the book arrived in Santo Domingo in the late 18th century and how the book was involved in the struggle for liberation. And also I will end to tell that if the, the printing arrived to, in Saint Domingue to repress the slave, they leave Haiti to liberate in Venezuela people, a slave. Uh, the first thing, <coughs> I, I, will, I, I will make three parts. We have to analyze before the Re French Revolution, what's happening in, in Saint Domingue before the, the French Revolution. The second period is during the revolution, how the print uh, in Saint Domingue, uh, with the same similarity in French, when the, the per permission royale well, it didn't exist. How we have an exponential uh, printer, a, a development of printing in, in Saint Domingue. In later on, I will try to describe what happened after the independence. In terms of literature, there are a lot of literature talking about uh, uh, the press, but they are talking about not the books, they are talking about the Gazette. We have a, a historian like Gabriel Desbiens, Antoinette Meunier, historian like Gabon, Clarence Brian, and Jean Fouchard. Jean Fouchard, uh, are, Jean Fouchard is the only one who try to analyze what's happened not only with books, but only with oral literacy, orality and literacy, and literacy for the black, uh, and the black uh, uh, slave. In, in uh, the, the prescription for black edu education was in force, but Fouchard discovered that some of the, the slave was able in the struggle for, 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 for maronage, was able to write full pass, passport. And, and there are a, lot, a small in, in description in the newspaper when they describe a black in, with, if, uh, what able to, uh, to write. Uh, doing though, uh, it's important to, uh, to tell that they are in that period, the demography in Haiti, we have more or less 50,000 master and half a million slaves. Uh, the, the master, not of all of the master, what the lit literacy people. And so they are not, but we have a, 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 some of uh, a paradox. In Saint Domingue, the, the press arrived in Saint Domingue in 16, uh, 1643, uh, 1624. We have a, 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 the, in the book of uh, Moreau de Saint Méry, Loi Constitution de Saint Domingue, we have a trace of a, a, a printer named Payen in Leogan, but it, it wasn't, it was, he didn't have the time to print. He, 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 he was arrested by the governor because they find that he, he, he was selling a pornographic and all licentious a, a books, like uh, another, another salesman uh, from Switzerland, De Gombaz, we, we are, we, we, we are forced to shoot to the, the United States to escape for that situation. You have here two of the first a uh, printing in Saint Domingue. One, uh, uh, the, the am I right? You have a book about the uh, imposition of four million. Is is in John Carter Brown Library, and the other one is uh, uh, the, the Bibliotheque Haitienne, the Père du Saint Esprit. You see, the first printer, we have a, 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 
uh, element to this card that he was the first printer. He started to print in January 16, uh, 1764. In the first gazette, the governor's advice, uh, make an advice for all of the masters to, be, uh, to have obligation to publish in the gazette the, the slave where we are in marronage. And we, are, we have in, in all of the gazette, we have a number of uh, advice to see w the description of who is in a, a, what we call the marronage uh, in Haiti. And the other, the other important things, in, in, uh, in spite of the few literacy people, is a paradox in Saint-Domingue. Saint-Domingue was more a factory than the colony where people try, uh, 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 was able to live. And we have the, the, in 1780, we have the creation of the, the Cirque de Philadelphia. We have the Academy, uh, Royal Academy, Scientific Academy. The Cirque de Philadelphia was a, a strong relation with the Benjamin Franklin uh, uh, in Philadelphia. And one of these two, this one, the, the Treaty of the Nepal, this is a, uh, a lot, is well known. It's well known, and you can saw also that the Voyage à Guaraca, another relation with the, with the Caribbean, the Great Caribbean. And the other import, very important thing with what we find in the dissertation sur le papier, Dissertation sur le papier, they know the Cirque de Philadelphia produced more than 20 books, scientific books about the, the uh, witness, etc., etc., and they uh, make a, a, a very important books about the uh, mineral water in Saint-Domingue. They describe all the mineral water that they have in, in all, of the, uh, all of the country. And this dissertation uh, for the paper is is the award that the Sierra de Philadelphia tried to force people to describe a, a secret, or they didn't find the way to conserve the the paper <coughs> uh, and again the, the the humidity and the other problem in in Saint Domingue. The, pre, um, the printing. In, you, we didn't, the characteristic of the printing in Haiti was in the service of the administration. We have n n no single book on religion, no book for education. Most, all of them, all of the document was most, a few, only few, was, a, we find one, one poetry book, one poetry brochure, and all of them are related with the administration. Related to the administration everywhere. Everywhere, you, uh, here we have two copies of uh, what I call uh, printing in the battlefield. In, the, in the, uh, 1793, Toussaint <coughs> and Rigaud, we, we have a, a civil war, they have two, uh, it have three, three, three provinces in the north, Capetian, in the south, the Kai, and we have the uh, uh, battle between Rigaud, the André Rigaud who was the first uh, mulatto general in the French army, and Toussaint. Each of them want to be the, the general in chief of the, and it's complicated. It's complicated to, to describe what is the discussion with, with uh, Rigaud was more rela uh, related with the French Republican. And a lot of authors describe to say as a, a son of a, a royal, he has a royal a, a origin in Africa. Cousin was more, more strong, stronger man and it, Rigo was a more Republican one. And before starting the war, each of them make a manifesto against the other. And this is a, a very, very, I, I think, it's very significant uh, informa uh, information uh, to, to, uh, to tell. Uh, 
So, Mac, Mac Clavin, he was an author of colonialism and science in the, in the same domain, described also the relation of Masonic Lodge between Haiti, same domain, that period, and, and diverse con uh, city, Philadelphia, for example. And we arrive in the time of the revolution when, when you have a huge uh, production of books. And after the revolution, uh, all of the countries in the Caribbean, and uh, also uh, in Virginia, uh, we have a people was afraid what was happening in Haiti. Was, uh, Haiti was putting in quarantine. And the, the symbol of that, I find it in the uh, dissertation of Alejandro Enrique Gomez from Venezuela. He talked about the Saint-Domingue Saint syndrome. And the Saint-Domingue syndrome was, was two way to analyze the syndrome of Saint-Domingue. We have the anti-slavery world from North America and in, in, in London, also in Paris. The, the anti-slavery world try to, to be involved, try to, to, to buy and to exchange uh, most of the imprint that, uh, uh, that we print in Saint-Domingue. And we have also the slavery world that was aware of what's happening in Saint-Domingue. And in the biography, uh, uh, so today we have uh, a lot of, as East Coast in the United States, a lot of printing material of that period. Uh, this this uh, uh, dissertation no, on the paper, uh, I found it in Philadelphia. I also have it in, in Power Press. Let's talk about the, the number, the figure of what, uh, you, you can saw the, during, uh, directly after the revolution was a, a number of 89 book and pamphlet published in Saint-Domingue. And it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a peak, it's between 18, 1788 and 1793. I have an hypothesis about what, how, after the 1793, we didn't find a lot of book, a lot of pamphlet, a lot of brochure. I think, uh, and I find some, my hypothesis is based uh, on the watermark uh, I find in one of the book. Uh, the watermark, is, 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 in the watermark, we, we, uh, I read, I was able to read it, uh, Blackwell, Blackwell, that means this paper didn't came from France. And uh, my hypothesis is based also in the, in the article of, uh, of uh, Roderick Cave, when he, when he talk about the early printing in the Caribbean, when he talk about the relation between the, the uh, Charlottesville and the English country in the Caribbean. And he, 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 based, he, he had a lot of printing. We find also uh, a printing in Charlottesville relating with Saint-Domingue. In 1763, we have, as a, a, a GCB uh, in the brochure, uh, recently by uh, a contestant who was the governor of the island, a book who has printed in Martinica in 1764. There are two other books we are printing in Saint-Domingue, and one uh, is, was printing four books in 1764 and 1765. One was printing in Charlottesville, in Virginia. That means uh, the, the, the trade be, between the uh, outside of, of Saint-Domingue, between U.S., Martinique, in, in Haiti, was uh, was uh, well, well doc is documented. Uh, other other relation with uh, North America uh, during the revolution is well known that uh, French people was escaped and f f a lot of them went to Cuba, some in Louisiana and Philadelphia and New York. In Boston also. And 
as we know, as we saw, uh, the, the EU, you have Mozart. Uh, previous, okay. This is a repartition of uh, the printer in Saint-Domingue before the revolution. You see, Mozart is the more important printer. You have more than 109 printing in Saint-Domingue. Mozart be be became, after the revolution, and be a, a, a consul in Boston. We didn't, we didn't find publication from Mozart in Boston, but the other printer, like Bouton, again, Bouton was a prominent uh, printer in Saint-Domingue also. He made a, a big fortune. Uh, it is well documented. Uh, I, I'm, very, I, I'm very unhappy when I read uh, the Mozart biography by his, by his daughter. He, the, his daughter didn't speak a lot about the printing. He, he, she didn't talk about about the painting. He, he, she talked about the, the Mozart as a consul in Boston, but we didn't find very, very uh, important information. And to, to continue, there, uh, about the Asian Revolution, there are a lot of things I've, uh, I've been writing, but uh, about how after the revolution, after the independence, there are a massacre of master and white person. Uh, the, the Declaration of Independence was signed also with ter for, for 30 general and was signed for two white master general who has struggled with the army of slaves. One of them was Wu, but Wu is not related with the, this print, uh, printer. Pierre Wu is a printer which arrived in Santo Domingo in, in 1791. He began to, to print in 1791. He continued to print. He, he printed for Toussaint Louverture. And, he, and sometimes he printed, this is an imprimé du gouvernement. He printed sometimes for, for Toussaint Louverture. We top imprimé du gouvernement. We got Pierre Wu, but we find imprimé du gouvernement. He continued to print for Leclerc. When Leclerc arrived in 1802, and he continued after the revolution, and I will show you the, the last one. What, what, when we, when we, uh, yesterday, when we are uh, listening, uh, uh, the, not yesterday, uh, uh, Thursday, about uh, the Las Casas, the different edition of Las Casas, I was, uh, I was interested, I, I decided to put this, this tweet. A history edition of the Constitution of uh, of Toussaint Louverture. In the, 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 the Constitution was made in, in, in July, but was published by Toussaint Louverture in August. And we have one of them, the, in the middle one, we have a, a printing by Pierre Wu in Cap Asian, in Cap, in Cap Francais. And the other one, a, 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 this Constitution de Saint-Domingue in the middle, there are two libraries. We have a simple Boston Athenium Library and Bibliothèque, de, Bibliothèque Nationale de France. The other one, Le Roux, is printing by Le Roux, Veuve G, Veuve Le Roux. The, the particular thing of uh, Jean Veuve Le Roux, the, the publication date is 13th of Messidor. The other two, the, 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 the basic one, is 14 of Messidor. And this, this one, it was imprimé de des lois, the third one. And it repeat the edition of Toussaint Louverture. I didn't read, like, like professor, professor that has done, comparing the, 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 three, the, three, the three edition to see if there are some change or some modification, et cetera, et cetera. But the first thing I find, there are the two dates. From Santo Domingo, San Saint Domingue to Haiti. The Constitution by Pierre Wu. Arrêté, arrêté, c'est un arrêté de Leclerc, imprimeur du gouvernement, when he, he declare Christophe is not 
all la loi, because he declared before uh, Toussaint was all la loi, after uh, Toussaint Louverture left Haiti, uh, uh, there are some, uh, some negotiation with uh, Leclerc and uh, Dessalines. They, 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 they start to, uh, uh, to, uh, to rule under the French uh, rule of Leclerc, after the, 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 the start the, before they start the revolution. And the other one, the last one, is the Pierre Roux de Cord de Cord Henry. The Cord Henry is a is a very, very rare book published in 1812 by the same Pierre Roux. By the same Pierre Roux. That means uh, that is not approve that in, during the war of revolution, they didn't kill all of the master, all of the white person. We, we believe that there was a slave who was working in the, in the print of, um, of Pierre Roux. The last observation about the printer, I said that the press arrived in 1764 uh, to repress the, the slavery. We have no, we have a, uh, 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 Gabriel Desbiens, uh, Antoine, Marie Antoine Meunier, and Jean Fouchard describe a uh, very, very, uh, about the theater, the theater uh, uh, in Saint Domingue. We, before the revolution and during the world of revolution, the, the French people was uh, always each night on the art theater to, uh, to uh, was presenting, but there are no printing. There are no printing about what was the, 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 the piece of the, the, the theater. But uh, in, in Leclerc, during the last month of the, of the, of the war, when he, he was sure that we had lost the war, he continued to amazing people at night. And to end that, uh, I continue uh, to say that finally, we, we know that uh, Miranda in 1806, 1806 came to Haiti, he have received help from Dessalines. And a particular thing, the, the, the flag of Haiti was black and white in that period. And we discovered that in Sevilla, uh, uh, that, that they have uh, the, the, the flag of Bolivar was yellow, black, and right. In 1817, when Pétion uh, received Bolivar, Pétion gave to Bolivar not only men for, the, for his army, um, he gave him also a little press. We believe that the only press in Kai was the press of Le Méry. Le Méry was a printer. We print the declaration of Rigaud against Toussaint Louverture. It was the only press we have in, uh, in, in Le Kai. And uh, my hypothesis, I said that if there are only one press in Le, in Le Kai, which has the press of Le Méry, and Bolivar received this press, I said the press arrived, this was a press for repression. It left Haiti to liberate the slaves in Venezuela. And some of historians, Venezuelan historians tell me that it's true that the f one of the first declarations that Bolivar uh, was published with that press, it was to liberate slaves. I end with that. To, uh, thank you very much. Let, 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 let me finish. I, I forgot this one. Uh, let, let, let me finish. Uh, let me finish what relation with United States. I forget it completely. <laughs> relation with United States and Haiti. Again, about the slavery. Uh, this was the sixth proclamation after the independence. The independence is January 1, 1804. In January 14, Dessalines make a declaration to free all of the slaves who arrived in Saint-Domingue, in Haiti, that period. And he, he promised 
40 good for each capital. We, 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 for, for the slavery. And also, more important, in the declaration, we saw the, a copy on sera immediately envoyed to the Congress of the States. That means the copy of the printing has to be sent to the Congress to United States Congress to advise them that we are free, we are liberated if slave. This is, again, the press went to Venezuela and we start to print things to liberate slaves. Thank you again. And now we'll continue with Cristina Soriano from Villanova with reading in a province with no printing press, literacy and circulation of books in late 18th century colonial Caracas. Okay, uh, thank you Ken and thank you the JCBL for organizing this uh, fascinating conference. It's been very exciting. And um, thank you Professor Terdier for uh, talking about Haiti. Just before I wanted to talk about Venezuela. And as you know, part of my work is also looking into how important and influential the Haitian Revolution was for Venezuelans. So instead of a, you know, following the same discourse of you know, Bolivar reading Rousseau, Voltaire, I'm looking more into how Bolivar used Petion and how, how much Venezuelans knew about Haiti and how they used uh, the information about Haiti to understand their own or to, to build their own political imaginations. Uh, in 1792, a year accepting, after accepting a position as a school teacher in Caracas, Simon Rodriguez struggled to find books in the city. It was a city without a single printing press or bookshop, and Caracas readers, teachers, and students really struggled to find or access printed materials. <coughs> Venezuela was one of the last provinces to have to receive royal permission from the king to have a printing press. It finally had a printing press in 1808, and it was basically because of the uh, Spanish monarchical crisis. They wanted to bring a printing press to Caracas in order to support the uh, rights of Ferdinand VII. So it was a very royalist uh, print. Uh, bodegas and pulperias offer a variety of inexpensive printed materials, such as catechisms, cartillas, devotional books, alongside with bottles of oil, olive oil, bags of grains, soaps, and stockings. Hundreds of calendars, catechisms, and cartillas were sold every year to a public that had learned to read with the Catholic syllabario and with the catechism. Rodriguez, however, did not belong to this massive group of novice readers. He had been educated in one of the three uh, Caracas schools and was well on his path to becoming the advocate of improvement of primary education in the city and the first one to propose a school for pardos in Caracas. After doing some research, he compiled a list of more than 15 books, all recently published in Spain, and I assume he was learning about these books because of the Gaceta de Madrid that arrive in Caracas every year. And the list covered a range of pedagogical titles, such as the art of reading and writing, general instructions on the teaching of algebra and arithmetic, and an innovative method to, for primary schools. Desperate, Rodriguez contacted a respected member of the Caracas elite, Don, Filano, Don Feliciano Palacios, who, you, who was Simon Bolivar's grandfather, and asked him for some help to find these precious printed materials. Palacios sent the book list to his son, Esteban, who was spending some, some months in Madrid, and said, I'm sending, quote, a list of books to you to buy for, uh, Simon, for Don Simon. Ask Iriarte to give you the money. Following his father's directions, Esteban diligently searched for the titles in the bookshops of Madrid. Three months later, he sent the volumes along with a note that says, Father, I'm sending the, book, the books you requested, but not all of them because they're quite expensive. Esteban spent 2,700 pesos on Rodriguez's books. Don Feliciano was not pleased to learn of this expenditure, which was in Venezuela the equivalent of a heavy, important, you know, luxurious piece of furniture, or even the price of an entire library. He knew he could not ask the humble school teacher to pay for, for these uh, books, so he ultimately decided to donate the books to Rodriguez. The anecdote of Rodriguez's books served to illustrate the complex dynamics of social status, literacy, education, race, and economic resources that operated in the colonial Venezuela. Rodriguez himself was an abandoned child and hijo, hijo exposito who was raised alone with his brother Jose Cayetano in the household of a parish priest, Alejandro Carreño. Although he was raised in a humble home with limited resources, Rodriguez was a white Creole. 
So he was able to receive a formal education which allowed him to work both as a scribe in the city council and as a teacher in the primary school. Neither of these positions was particularly lucrative, at least not sufficiently to allow Rodriguez to buy the book he needed, uh, but as they were imported from Spain and, and Europe countries, books were really expensive. They were considered luxury books in, in Venezuela, and they were inaccessible for the majority of the population. Venezuela, however, as you probably know, with the rest of Latin America, is not a strict, in a strict sense, class society. Rodriguez's lack of money did not prevent him from acquiring these ma printed materials using his connections because of his occupation and, of course, uh, his race. Um, in fact, uh, for Venezuela, it was really common to find books through the uh, this operation of what I call encargos or private commissioners, uh, just asking people in the peninsula to bring the books. 18th century Venezuela was a highly stratified society, but it was permeable. Race, family ties, education, honor, economic resources all play important roles in defining the place of each individual within the society. Overlapping social and economic networks and the absence of a class hierarchy facilitated social mobility. Still, not all social groups had equal access to education because it was prohibited that the pardos could go to public education. Public education is only for whites. And literacy and the possession of books represented markers of social status, of course. Literate and formally educated people generally belong to the white elites and most of them possessed large library and economic resources to continue enlarging their libraries. While the majority of the supposedly non-literate population belonged to lower social groups of colors, including the pardos, not only blacks, and that's, this is something important in Venezuela, 55% of the population are considered pardos, which is mixed race or sang legs, basically. Um, they barely had the means to buy a couple of relig religious broadsides in the uh, Bulperia, and they largely uh, relied on the me oral media for the transmission of knowledge. However, by the end of the 18th century, this picture had begun to change. The number of people who owned books increased, the size and diversity of private libraries had grown, the incipient informal market of books had begun to operate, and new networks for the circulation of books and printed material expanded. Many of Venezuelans adopted the Spanish reformist model that promoted literacy and formal education for the common people, while calling for the secularization of knowledge and the promotion of ciencias útiles. This movement entailed a social expansion of literacy, which was also reinforced by the torrent of printed materials that are coming from the Caribbean. Although elites continue to hold the majority of important libraries in the urban centers of the province, a more stable book market and increasing circulation of used printed materials are bringing members of different social groups, especially lower social groups, such as artisans and laborers, into a more regular contact with the written word. In a colonial society with no printing press, um, books and, and printed materials were expensive, but it's clear that the lack of money did not prevent Venezuelans of modern means to acquire printed materials. Public auctions, remates, and expanding circuit of book lending and transcription of books were some of the strategies that the large public in Venezuela used in order to get in contact with printed materials. Also, a number of teachers and university professors sought to open the world of reading to the uneducated, uneducated masses. A new network of spreading written materials connected the farthest reaches of the province. Semi-literate practices of knowledge transmission, like reading aloud, performing dialogues, discussing texts in groups, also brought more Venezuelans together in contact with texts that had been in inaccessible just years earlier. During the French and the Haitian revolutions, these incipient networks for the circulation of written materials also served to spread anti-monarchical propaganda, abolitionism, and egalitarian ideas, and of course, anti-colonial anti -colonial sentiments. From 1789 to 1810, 1808, revolutionary texts from Europe and America, but more specifically from San Domingo, Santo, Spanish Santo Domingo, Trinidad, and Martinica, filtering into the coast of Venezuela, mortifying local officials and elites, and arousing the curiosity of the general population. These revolutionary texts arrived in a moment when reading, as a cultural practice, was undergoing important transformation locally. Just following Professor Chartier, Erin Bagjong in the case of uh, independence of in Mexico, and, and, and recently Andrew Pettigree, 
who argue that political social changes are the results not merely of intellectual operations, but of a more complex transformation in everyday practices with the reading and writing, and in changes with the relationship between readers and the reading materials. What matters at the end is not what people read, but how they read it, and how these practices led to the emergency of a public spaces for discussion of ideas, political projects, and social prerogative, the emergency of a public sphere, basically. Here I attempt to reconstruct some of Venezuelan strategies for accessing books and the world of reading in a place with no printing press, but that at the end became one of the first places to declare independence from Spain in 1810. Books lending networks, public auctions, the circulation of handwritten extracts of books, chapters, reading aloud meetings were all practices that contributed to the expansion of literacy and brought more light into the role of written text in the everyday life. Although it's certainly important to identify the kind of books that fill Venezuelan shelves and to analyze how literary taste has changed over the second half of the 18th century, I'm also interested in understanding how reading became a tool for socialization and for the integration or deformation of what I call political communities that even conspire against the government at the end of the 18th century. Uh, little has been done on the study of literacy in colonial Venezuela during the 18th century. Nevertheless, there are some interesting few students that provide some information about private libraries, mostly, and lists of books arriving on ships. That's from Contratación in Sevilla. These studies can be used to shed some light on reading tastes and practices in the province toward the end of the 18th century. But however, if we take, for example, in consideration the numbers of wheels that contain inventories, we may think that only 13% of the population in Caracas possessed books or had the capacity or skills uh, to know how to read them. But as you probably know, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, uh, wheels are something, sometimes tricky because there are people, not, all the, not people had money to hire someone to bring and to have the inventory of books. Sometimes they have books that they don't want to include in the inventory. So that's kind of a, we know that it's a, it's a tricky uh, uh, data. And then also there are, there are people who have books in the library and they're not reading them. So there's a, you know, a lot of possibilities. However, based on my research with wheels and testaments, post-mortem library inventories and ship importation lists, I have found that traditionally, of course, the clergy uh, was the, 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 the followed by the local nobility were the uh, group that had the largest libraries. In Caracas, for example, the clergy possessed almost 20% of uh, private libraries uh, registered in the inventories. The white nobility, the high militia, and the planters possess another 25%. So together, these groups of power had almost 70% of all the books. Then we have other uh, groups like merchants who possess 15% of the private libraries of the post-motor inventories, and then men of letters, basically lawyers, seminar professors, teachers, scribes, that possess 10% of those uh, inventories. I found very few poor whites small libraries. I have not found any records of libraries possessed by pardos, which represent the 60s, 55% of the population, free blacks or slaves. However, it's important to know that very few inventories belong to pardos and not any inventories for African descendants or slaves. The question in this case is whether this meant that pardos, free African sla uh, slaves or free uh, black people, did not read. And as I will show in a little bit, that's not the case. In 17, between 1760 and 1810, several containers with great numbers of books arrived every month in the port of La Guaira, where the Compañía with Busguana first, but then private merchants received, received commercialized them, and distributed to num numerous ed uh, editions among the avid rivers, shopkeepers, and owners of pulterias. Compared to earlier decades, the last three decades of the 18th century, there's an increase of the 30% of books titles that are coming to uh, La Guaira. I have also found that the books that came to the province of Venezuela are more diverse. Uh, by the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, the importation of religious books decreased drastically to a half, while there was a significant growing presence of books about politics, government, administration, commerce, education, mathematics, military and engineer, and manuals for artisans. My research with private libraries also show a drastic decrease of religious books. During the uh, decade of 1770 to 1780, 65% of the books are religious. In the last decade of uh, the first decade of the 19th century, between 1800s and 1810, only 30% of the books in the private libraries are from religion. 
So this new configuration of Caracas private libraries went hand in hand with the Spanish reformism that promoted progress and development through better understanding and knowledge of the regions and natural resources, labor diversification with some um, condiment of uh, the importance of slavery, of course, wise administrative politics and the improvement of commercial activities. Several editions of books written by European and Spanish reformists like Pedro Rodríguez de Campomanes, uh, Nicolás Moratín, Melchor de Jovellanos, of course, but, uh, Jerónimo Feijó, Jerónimo Staris, arrive in Venezuela every year during the end of the 18th century. Uh, I also found a more, uh, in general, a more stable and structured market for books and newspapers emerging at the end of the 18th century in Venezuela. Uh, it was, of course, very common to find in the pulperias these little uh, small librillos or cartillas, but also I found the only, I haven't found a library or a printing shop, but I found two captains selling books in their homes in La Guaira. And one of them is Antonio Romero. He basically passed away and when they went to his house to do the inventory, they called it that the house had a part of a bodega. And the bodega is, was exclusively a place for selling books because it's the only thing, he, the only goods he had in the bodega. Mm. So he seems to be, they don't call him a librero or a library, but he seems to be uh, doing that role. Public auctions were also wonderful places to acquire used books with good prices. One of the things that I, on, I found in Venezuela, in Caracas at the end of the 18th century, is that a more, more pardos are accessing those public auctions. And this is the case of Juan Bautista Olivare, who's a pardo who basically self-educating himself because he couldn't go to public education. And when he was asked where, how did he learn to read and write, he said, well, just people around me help me you know, learn to read and write, and then they asked him, how do you buy books? And he said, I went to public auctions to buy the books. He went to the remates to buy some books. He ended up being the musician of the cathedral in Caracas. In addition, I also see the proliferation of social spaces where politics, books, authors, and readings were discussed. People of diverse social groups gathering in inns, taverns, pulperias, and barber shops to talk about Atlantic politics, books, and writings. Uh, these discussions were uh, sometimes the downs to inhabit to the fighting inhabitants to governmental institutions like the city council, the Real Audiencia, the, and re, the Real Intendencia. Those denunciations offer a good idea of how frequent people lend and borrow books. Everyone was telling that they were reading a book someone else, uh, or they borrowed from someone else. Uh, an interesting document by the Holy Inquisition gave us some idea of these uh, practice of uh, borrowing or circuits of lending books. During April 1806, uh, officers of the uh, Holy Inquisition visited the house of more than 25 people in Caracas who were suspect of reading for forbidden books. In response, uh, the, these agents always asked them, uh, I heard that you have the Rousseau in your house. I mean, can you give me? Can I see it? Right? Uh, the response of the neighbors were always the same. Yes, I used to have the text, but I loaned it to someone else, and I don't remember who. Um, yeah, I read the book, but I gave it back to the owner, who, by the way, was a foreigner. There's always this idea that the foreigners are, bring, are bringing uh, forbidden books. Um, Benito Prada, one of the agents of Holy Office, asked Juan Vicente Bolívar, tío de, um, I'm, I'm sorry, uncle of Simon Bolívar, if he had the Rousseau, La Julia. Bolívar answered, I used to have it, but I returned it to the foreigner who had lent it to me. Then he asked to Domingo Diaz if he had the book, The History of the Revolution by Robertson, and Diaz answered, yes, I remember reading, it, reading the first volume, but then I lent the book to Don Francisco Gonzalez, and I'm sure he lent it to someone else. When finally Don Gabriel Aponte and other officers of the Holy Inquisition asked about, uh, Don Gabriel Aponte about La Jaira by Voltaire, he said, and I quote in Spanish, Ese libro está normalmente corriendo libremente y hoy no sé dónde para. Se lo he prestado a alguien, pero ya no recuerdo a quién. So, books are running, basically. That's what he's saying, running. In Caracas and La Guardia, readers became also copies and transcribers of books. So they will lend books so you can quote or, co or copy one part of the book. Seminar and university professors even train their students to copy part of the books and make them circulate among the class. Caracas private libraries contain not only printed, but also lots of manuscript books. The library of Governor Pedro Carbonell, for example, contained a manuscript on painting paper about the use of arms and other military tactics. 
The library of the priest um, dean of the university, Jose Ignacio Moreno, included a hand copy version of what he called the Treaty of Philadelphia, which I assume is the uh, Constitution of the United States. Members of the Inquisition were especially concerned about this practice of copying and translating texts because they were serving as a way to obscure or hide a, um, a clandestine circuit of forbidden texts or circulation of forbidden texts. One last note in the um, uh, notebook of the Holy Inquisition said, Don Rafael Lugo has mentioned the Reinal several times. In past days, he even showed me a hand copy paragraph that he translated. So he read the Reinal in French, and then he translated it into Spanish and put it in the manuscript. That same manuscript, he passed it along to Don Rafael Mejías and to Don, Don Fernando Montillas and to Don Diego Urbaneja. So these are, you know, just transcripts that are manuscripts that are being uh, circulating around. Now, most of these books and manuscripts are found in the libraries of white priests, rich planters, and military officials. But what's going on with the part of the population? And the first question I was kind of asking myself is, if I want to understand how they access the printed word, I also have to understand what kind of education they're receiving. I mean, if they're not, they're not allowed to go to public schools, how are they learning to read and write? How are they participating in the literacy uh, world? Well, the same... Um, um, Simon Rodriguez was so concerned with the education of Pardos, he's basically very influenced by Spanish reformism. He believed that they have to expand literacy through uh, two artisans and laborers. But of course, in Venezuela, artisans and laborers are all Pardos. So there is a race question coming there. He couldn't care. He believed that Pardos should be educated. But of course, the majority of the white elite were not very happy and comfortable, especially because they're seeing what's going on in Haiti, in San Domingue of about having Pardos being uh, educated. Uh, however, he wrote um, a manual that he gave to uh, the city council alerting about the importance of primary education in Caracas and uh, creating a project for the school of Pardos. He said, the mechanical arts are linked in the city and elsewhere in the province with Pardos and Morenos. They do not have anyone to teach them. They cannot attend the school of whites, and poverty limits them from their childhood. So they learn through practice, but without technique. Lacking this, they proceed in everything with improvisation. They become teachers without ever being, ever being students, excepting those who, with an extraordinary vigor, have achieved their instruction thanks to painful efforts. So, since they belong to society, Rodriguez believed that Pardos needed an education as much as whites. Therefore, he proposed the creation of a school of Pardos, where they could all find an appropriate place to learn and grow. In the opinion of Rodriguez, beauty salons and barber shops are not schools. Why is he saying that? Well, he found a barber shop with 50 Pardo kids attending to learn to read and write, and the barber was a teacher in the morning. Um, uh, so he said, barbers and artisans do not have the educational methods to teach kids how to read and write. They don't have the proper teaching skills. They don't have the authority to educate. I quote, these improvised teachers do not even know who their students are and how they have progressed. They cannot continue teaching like this because these children are learning to read and to comb the hair, to write and to shave at the same time. <coughs> Rodriguez's account gives us a clear and detailed picture of the state of popular education in Caracas, its vices and multiple problems that local government needed to attend. It also provides valuable information about the education of Pardos and the social spaces for this education. In the first place, there seemed to be an informal space that is being used to teach Pardos how to read and write. Um, but in the opinion of Rodriguez, they were learning in improper settings and through inadmissible ways. One of the critiques of Rodriguez um, is that the Pardos are learning how to write with the catechism structure. So they only know how to write if the, the formula is questions and answers, questions and answers. So he's saying that we need to, they need to teach Pardos how to read kind of a, a coherent, fluid narrative. On the other hand, Rodriguez also provided an image of barber shops and beauty salons as places for socialization, teaching, exchanging knowledge, and debating ideas. 
Uh, in Caracas and La Guaira, barbershops and beauty parlors were also places where people of different social groups, and that's another important fact about barbershops, uh, they were not, uh, they're not segregation. Uh, whites and bardos both attended the same barbershops. Professionals, merchants, militiamen, students, artisans used to attend uh, barbershops to play board games, to chat with friends, to read papers aloud, to borrow books and share ideas, and to even conspire against the government. In 1797, a Republican conspiracy was uncovered in the port of La Guaira. The main goals of the movement were diverse. They include the establishment of the free trade, the abolition of slavery with the compensation to slave owners, the elimination of Indian tribute, and the abolition of taxes. The movement also sought to foster a harmony among races, white, pardos, Indians, and blacks are all seen as brothers in Jesus Christ. Though they were white, the, both the leaders were both white Creoles, Manuel Gual and Jose Maria España, and in fact is recognized as the conspiracy of uh, Gual uh, España. I don't use that name because I recognize two other important leaders who are pardos, so I prefer to call it the conspiracy of La Guaira. Uh, but the interesting thing is they found remarkable support among a group of pardos, whites, small merchants, royal officials, soldiers, and artisans from La Guaira and Caracas. All of these actors participated in a complex network of information through which ideas of revolution, liberty, equality, and republican principles were spread. Official records of the inquiry reveal that insurgents produced a considerable number of written texts, manuscripts, designed to structure followers in the republican principles of the movement. Among these texts, there were proclamations of insurrection, poems, stories, dialogues, a letter, translation and adaptation of the Declaration of the Rights of Men and Citizen, and revolutionary texts from France, Spain, Saint-Domingue, and Guadeloupe. These texts provide a helpful vantage point for understanding the insurgents' diverse strategies for imparting political knowledge and galvanizing their supporters. Interestingly, I found that the conspiracy of La Guaira was planned by a socially diverse group of people who together created a network for the production and distribution of texts. So I'll mention some of the people who work in planning there. There's a white Creole port official who was the one in charge of collecting the gazettes that arrived to the port of La Guaira. He was, he was hired by the government. So he was someone, he was an official, but he was basically doing the opposite. He was gathering the gazettes in order to contribute to the archive of the conspiracy. There are two white Creoles, while in España, who were sharing their wonderful libraries, who had lots of French titles, with the rest of the people participating in the uh, conspiracy. They had meetings in their houses where they will read aloud texts and they will share the text with other partners. There was a French barber, uh, well, he was not a barber because he was um, a peluquero, which is someone who basically, okay. Yeah, and he said, I'm not, I mean, he, of course, in the trial, he said, you're a, you're a barber. And he was like, no, 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 I'm not a barber, I'm a peluquero, right? He was, along with a the pharmacist, they were taking some of the gazettes that the uh, white official was collecting, and they would translate the gazettes to the rest of the people in the work, working in the conspiracy. There was, of course, a Spanish prisoner uh, who basically designed the Conspiracion de San Blas, Juan Bautista Picornel, who was in prison in La Guaira, and he fabricated political stories, dialogues, and political catechisms. There was a barber shop, a pardo barber shop, his name is Narciso del Valle, who visited Picornel, took part of Picornel's text, brought them to his barber shop, transcribed the, some of the text, spread the text, and also offered services of reading aloud the text in the barber shop. So the barber shop and then being a crucial base for this Republican conspiracy in La Guaira. The text written by Picornel and spread in the barber shop aim at creating a consciousness of how the king and his functionaries have oppressed their vassals, insisted in the idea of responsibly defending the America fatherland, la patria americana, and legitimated the idea of rebellion as the only resource to establish revolutionary equality and fraternity with a Christian love for others and divine justice. Picornell, as you know, was originally a teacher, so he must really know, had a clear idea of how to capture the attention of the readers, especially of the Pardo readers who've been 
learning how to read and write through catechism. So that's why you see Picornell being so emphatic about creating catechism, dialogues, poems, and even a song, La Canción Americana. Uh, the fundamental aim of this text was to gain support from the black and the mixed race population of La Guaira and Caracas. Therefore, the texts were written in a style and discourse appropriate for reading out loud, using familiar narrative formulas, such as epistles, dialogues, and stories, short and easy enough to be digested or memorized by heart to be retold orally. The manuscripts produced in La Guaira provide readers and listeners, and this is another thing, with something that no other revolutionary text had offered before, an intimate awareness of their own reality. I mean, this is a place without printing press. And every time the city council sent a letter to the king asking for permission to have a printing press, their main argument is that we need to read our own stuff. I mean, if you want to be, you want us to be, uh, to progress in agriculture, we need our own peasants and agriculture to tell us how to uh, deal with our climatic differences, our soil. So that idea, of, there's kind of an agony of misrepresentation. They're tired of reading foreign texts or distant texts. So for the first time, this text produced by Picornel and all the conspirators participating in the conspiracy are bringing that reality together. Um, with no printing press, People in Venezuela frequently complain about the seeming irrelevance of peninsular books, French treatises, or even North American proclamations to their geopolitical situation. But the writings in the conspiracy of La Guaira seem to have ended this ag agony of misrepresentation, speaking directly to their concerns. These texts offer an accurate picture of colonial reality, the lack of justice, the unfair and negligible social mistreatments, the tyranny of the monarchical rule, and the absurdity of royal differences or fueros. These texts were particularly appealing to Venezuelan of African, uh, people of African descent. They were written in styles appropriate to reading out loud, and they used familiar and easy to memorize narrative formulas, uh, such as dialogues and stories. P. Cornell even decided to instruct the Pardo Narciso del Valle, the barber, to become a writer himself. And there's one story that was written by uh, Narciso del Valle. He sent it back to Picornell so he can basically proofread the story. And then Picornell said, well, it's still too elevated for black people to understand. The transmission of principles of freedom and abolition in the case of the uh, conspiracy of La Guaira was transformed in two ways. In one hand, they adapted the writings of French, Saint-Domingue, Caribbean texts to the social and political environment of Venezuela, but at the same time, they, create, they make substantial adjustments in order to create a discourse that was in order to reach the different sectors of the population. Their idea was not only to have to, uh, let me see, may, okay, they, were, they wanted to make sure that people of color were active participants in the process of spreading, spreading information and not simply recipients of knowledge. They want them to be active political actors and not passive followers of the political movement. So I'm going to ask Patrick and Alpin and Christina to join the table, and I will have some brief comments. Let me sneak out. I think I, I, I just want to start with a, a minor comment, I think, um, and uh, pick up where, where Christina was, was ending about the argument on um, we need a press for local production for mm -hmm. our works, which actually kind of speaks to some of the things that Patrick was working on in terms of the... Um, the, the pamphlet war that was going on during the during the uh, during and after the revolution and to to Alpin. So I, I 
I appreciate the intersection between the two, but kind of more generally, what struck me about these three talks was the, the, the intersection, not just between the local, right, but how, and also this relates to uh, Junior Fortado's mm -hmm. talk uh, yesterday, was the incredible um, circulation of materials, French ideas in Venezuela, um, American ideas in Haiti, right? These long distance networks, border crossing, not just of ideas, but of uh, people and the physical books themselves. Um, Jack Green has, a, um, has an aphorism, and I used the word periphery at one point recently, mm -hmm. and someone took me to task about it, saying that it was kind of um, out of fashion to use the word periphery. Um, but Jack, Jack's aphorism is that there's power on the periphery, and I think one of the things that, that all three of these get at in the kind of circulation of ideas, in the way ideas circulated, particularly in Christina's paper, is how that power on the periphery gets formed, mm -hmm. right? Um, and since I work on what might be considered in Spanish America a metropole, right? I work on Mexico and you know, pay attention to Lima. Uh, in some ways, that, that kind of formation is not as apparent to me Right? You, you guys are working on the periphery, on the margins, so that actually makes things clearer where there is the, um, the conflict and contestation. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm going to just leave it at that and open up our discussion for, uh, for questions uh, because we're about, f we only have about 15 minutes before we break for lunch, so I want to allow everyone else to jump in here as well. So with that, Martin. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, all three of you, for really interesting papers. Um, since we are kind of running short on time, I guess I, I have about 100 questions. Uh, <laughs> As regarding the printing in the battlefield, uh, my point of view is to describe the, the specificity of the printing in Saint Domingue. In also after in it was the same. Uh, the, the, printing, the printing arrived to serve the administration. And you have no books about religion. No book, there are no, 
In, in that period, there was no school also in, in Saint Domingue. Most of the masters sent the, 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 the child to France, and also you have uh, when he went to Saint Louverture, was the governor, he sent his two boys in France. Mm -hmm. That means uh, the, the problem of education in it was it, there are some discussion, but with the the, the interdiction for the slave, they did it near the, 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 the governor, the, 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 the mass of the, the master didn't create a school. We have also uh, I mean, uh, the contradiction with the Cerf de Philadelphia. They create a strong academic, royal academic, scientific one. As we go, I don't know. I don't know. I, the, the pre, when the press arrived, they always said the, uh, you, to send to the people. The, the press was in force, and when the, most of the proclamation, and regarding to the uh, Creole, Saint Onax, Saint Onax and Paul Verrel, mm -hmm. in 1783, and John Carter have a lot of proclamation, in French and in Creole. The, uh, and at the end of the proclamation in Creole, we, we have a, a five sentence, a very important sentence. This proclamation, have to, uh, we have to put in the, all of the city, have to be read in Creole so the black people can understand it. You don't find the same sentence in French. And as regarding the, the Creole in other languages, in the, in the 19th century, we have some proclamation in French and in Spanish. And in Spanish. When Haiti uh, invaded Santo Domingo, it wasn't, Santo Domingo was at that period colony of French because uh, 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 French occupied, uh, 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 Spain was occupied by, by, by the French army of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And the proclamation of President Boyer was in French and always in French and in Spanish. And I don't know what language they are, they are talking about. Most of the constitution to the, in, in, in the middle of the 19th century, they talk about languages of Haiti. They didn't say French and Spanish. They didn't say French and Creole. They talk about languages that they are, we, we talk in Haiti. In Haiti, between 1822 to 1844, was one unique state, the entire island. So they are, uh, language, uh, language, uh, uh, what, what I say, you can say, what, when they, uh, necessity, they, are, they, are, they know that they have to talk with the, all of the people in Creole. Is, as regard to occupation on Santo Domingo, they have to publish also in Spanish. Um, yeah, about your question. Um, so in 1793, between 1793 and 1790, Six, there are <coughs> 1,000 San Domingans living in, in La Guaira. And La Guaira is a town of s between 6,000, six 7,000 people. The reason why they're there is because they were capturing the war between Santo Domingo and San Domang. And Joaquin Garcia, the governor of Santo Domingo, decided to send them to La Guaira, basically to get rid of them. And among that, that group, there are slaves, refugees, soldiers who are prisoners of uh, Spain. And André Renoir, which is the peluquero, was among that group of people. But he stayed in La Guaira. I don't know why, because at the end, everyone, I mean, the governor in Venezuela is trying to spell them, and the, they, he ended sending them, all of them, to Cuba. But they live in La Guaira for three years, and André Renoir, who basically identified himself as a peluquero, stayed in La Guaira. So I'm wondering, I mean, he's French. I mean, he's, he's from San Domingue. So I'm wondering if there's a cultural differentiation between what he understood as a peluquero and a barber. And he's making sure he, they, don't, they don't see him as Narciso del Valle, who is the Pardo barber, owner of the barber shop. 
So I'm wondering, I, I'm guessing that he says he's a peluquero because he works with pelucas, with wigs. Why Narciso del Valle is more the traditional barber shop uh, performing small dentist works and surgeries and puntos. Uh, so there's a little difference there. And, and then, of course, André Renoir was accused of reading in French and translating the text. And he would say, no, I was only reading literature. And so he, would, he found the ways to escape uh, being accused of. Yeah. Uh, Domingo and then Neil. Um, well, as Venezuela myself, I was delighted with uh, uh, Christina's presentation mm -hmm. because of the angle that she see in this particular period in Venezuela. And uh, I have many questions, of course, I have. I, I can only ask one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the relation of uh, Simon Rodriguez with the uh, Corporación de la Guaya. Uh -huh. And the, uh, after this event, uh, Rodriguez disappeared from mm -hmm. Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And then um, we know that after uh, he probably went to Philadelphia mm -hmm. and, and he worked in a printed press in Philadelphia. So, can you please just okay. give us a little bit? Yeah, I mean, there's still debate Eva, about if he participated in the conspiracy or, or not, and they're not proof that he did, but uh, you're totally right. He basically left the country like two months after the conspiracy was discovered in July, and he left in October. Um, so there's some debate to, you know, probably he was part of the conspiracy, one of the people in Caracas, because there are two circles, the ones in La Guaira and the ones in Caracas, and presumably he was one of the people who participated in the conspiracy from Caracas, but there's no proof of that. He basically escaped the, the trial, and um, I will assume that he was he was there. Uh, probably not as uh, as an active as Picornel, but interested in because they probably had the same sort of uh, you know inclinations and motivations. Uh, his project for a school of Pardo was never approved. Uh, so yeah, he had nothing. He, at the end, he said something like, "There's I had nothing to do with uh, that." Uh, Ronald Briggs, who's a professor in Barnard College, uh, had a very interesting book about Simon Rodriguez that you will probably be interested in reading. Yeah. Neil. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I, um, I was just thinking also about what Rosine could have done if he had talked about un peliquero de cualidad instead of un or uh, later on. Um, I wanted to uh, also just make a, a bit of a reflection on, uh, based on Christina's paper, which I thought was uh, opened up uh, a whole series of questions that would have been wonderful to pose at the outset. Um, and hopefully we can have the time to talk about the way that those sorts of questions do, which is that um, it seems to me that the by choosing, making a choice about uh, printed culture uh, and or the library or the book or printers or whatever it is, we make certain assumptions about uh, what is important uh, in terms of our own socio-cultural critique. And um, there was a, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with um, other examples of this than the uh, Brazilian case, but it actually began with the French case of the Histoire de la Vie which then had uh, lots of lives uh, probably elsewhere, but certainly in Brazil, the Historia de la Vida Privada. Mm -hmm. I remember in particular the chapter that I think uh, Laura Gimeli Souza wrote about uh, uh, written culture, Cultura de Prada, and exactly getting at these questions of when we talk about books, when we talk about interior spaces, who are we actually speaking of? Um, and uh, I think that um, you know one of the ideas behind you know, focusing on sort of this idea of, mer of merchants, uh, even though it's this 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 meeting has been much broader than strictly the kind of the commerce of books, is getting at how these uh, how ideas and information travel beyond a particular social class. Mm -hmm. um, it occurs to me that we also could have invited people who work, um, and there are many now, who are working on maritime cultures of communication, uh, which obviously intersect uh, printed culture, but um, also extend far beyond printed culture uh, and, uh, and, and, and may force us to add, actually ask very different kinds of Question. So um, this is just a sort of a comment to throw out. Uh, if, if any of you want to uh, respond, I would actually be curious to hear it. 
appreciate also um, if that's if that's something that in a very different context than metropolitan Spain, metropolitan France, or metropolitan England, this kind of conversation, this kind of group of people who are working on the history of print can actually contribute to uh, uh, conversations that are going on in the history of, 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 of print and book culture more broadly. You can use this afternoon, perhaps not? Yeah, we can, we, we, we can sort of bring anything. If you want to comment now on a certain topic. Sure. The multifaceted problem that is very important that we can talk with this project this afternoon. Sure. Okay. Yes. Other questions for our panelists today? Uh, Tanya and...